a very good friend of mine. And he has got a really good message here, uh, which is interesting. So, welcome to Jeremy. You're using that one. Artist that you're going to see. Well, I hope we're going to claim back a little bit of art for the Lord this morning, because these artists that you see had a profound biblical knowledge and biblical insight and informed everything they did. So you might be a little bit surprised at some of the paintings this morning. Can we have the first slide up, please? Well, I'm going to do it in the form of a top 10. It's not really my top 10 favorite paintings. In fact, some of my very favorite paintings aren't in here because I've taken them out and I've got separate talks on just those individual paintings. But I think it's fun to do that. And at the end, I'm going to, Paul is going to hand out a sheet and I'm going to give you a chance to vote on what your favorite one was today. And, uh, and we'll see which is the winner. But if you're expecting... There may be a few surprises this morning and a few challenges as well, because if you're expecting an endless catalogue of Madonnas and Child and that sort of thing, you may be surprised at some of the areas we're going to go in this morning. But my first entry at number 10 uh, should be familiar to most of you. Next one, please. Which is Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. But just before we look at that, I'll just read the scripture for you. Like I thought, I can't see the scripture on the screen, so I did my out of a black up plan. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28 says this. Then God said, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I'll just put my phone timer on, if that's all right. Okay, so first slide should be Michelangelo, the creation of Adam. I'm sure this is very familiar to you. It's uh, work done by Michelangelo, which is found on the Sistine Chapel, and it's considered an absolute cornerstone of Renaissance art, but more than that, Western art. The, the, the creation of Adam is one part of an enormous, what's called a fresco. It's a panel of a huge ceiling masterpiece. The painting illustrates the biblical creation taken from the narrative of the book of Genesis, in which God is seen to breathe life into Adam. But did you know that probably this is the main image which now we take for granted, but this is probably the main image which created the idea of God as an elderly man with a white beard. And uh, we see him also wrapped in a swirling coat. Adam is seen on the lower left of the picture. Oh yeah, I can see it there, yeah. Adam is seen on the lower left of the picture and he's completely naked, which illustrates, of course, that he's been newly created. Do any of you remember where we used to see this picture every week on television? All through the 70s and 80s and 90s? The South Bank Show, that's right. It was used in the introduction to the South Bank Show. But things that are interesting about this picture, which you may not have noticed, is there are hidden symbolic messages included in things like the fact that shaped behind the figure of God, if you look at that, the, uh, the, the frame in which he's placed in is an anatomically accurate outline of a dissection of the human brain. Now some painting experts also point out that behind Adam is the anatomical shape of a female womb and that the scarf represents, which is floating underneath, represents the newly cut umbilical cord saying that what he was showing here was the point of separation from, of man from God following the creation as a result of the fall. You see, Michelangelo, like many artists of the time, attended dissections. And we actually saw a whole load of his dissections at a display in Glasgow Art Gallery about three or four years ago. Uh, you also note the image of the nearly touching hands of God and Adam. That's become almost an icon, hasn't it, in people's mind. And in fact, so much so that it's been imitated and it's also been parodied by people like Monty Python and others. The creation of Adam is regarded as one of the three most recognized paintings in the world. 
Interesting, the first one is Mona Lisa, the second one is the Last Supper, and the third one is this. It is also the most replicated painting of all time. We have some coasters at home with, on, <laughs> with it on it. Uh, so you'll not be surprised that it's come in at number 10 in my top 10 list of reg religiously inspired painting. But they shall not all be quite so conventional from here on. Let's have a look at that here. So number nine, and I'll just read another scripture for you, which is from Genesis 11 verses one to eight. Now the whole world had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So this is very early in Genesis, uh, the generations following uh, the, the, the early chapters with, with uh, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Uh, then they said to one another, come, let us build bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had absalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower which top is to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they have begun to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language. And they did not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the face of the earth, and they ceased building a city. Now there's an element of disobedience there because God had commanded people to go out and cover the whole world. And as soon as the, the early generations, what did they do? They went out and they built themselves a city, which was not God's plan. Next slide, please. So the next painting is Peter Bruegel the Elder, and it's the Tower of Babel, painted in 1563. Peter Bruegel, uh, or Bruegel, is considered one of the great, uh, greatest of the Dutch and the Flemish art artists of the Renaissance period. Although the work, it's an early painting, and although the work appears almost naive and gives a sense of simplicity, there are some very interesting and highly complex and rich metaphors in it. They, he, he did that in all his work, and it's particularly noticeable in this one. The painting, as I said, depicts the story in Genesis, where the people begilled, begin to build a tower, and as they declare this tower they're going to build is going to go all the way to heaven. The futility of this effort is being demonstrated in this painting. Note the tower he chooses to paint is actually reminiscent of the Roman Colosseum. And on the surface, it may appear to be well-designed, Many ex art experts believe that the, the, the style of the, of the tower is a reference to the Roman church seen through the eyes of Bruegel, who would have been part of the Reformation movement in Europe at that time. But if you look closely at the tower, you'll get a sense that it almost appears to be leaning, almost leaning and rotating as if it's unstable. The detail of the work are fascinating because you'll also notice that if you look closely at this man-made Ephesus, part of it are being built, so they haven't finished building it, but part of it is being repaired at the same time. The bottom left foreground shows the, the, the picture uh, is believed to be an illustration of, the, of Nimrod called the Pride of King Nimrod, which also follows on from the biblical story as he leads a parade of knights and religious leaders around that building. But the painting is recognizing the fact that what Babel taught was, first of all, that we need to be careful about hubris, about arrogance, about living and planning and building without God in our pounds, but also warning against totalitarianism, what it can do when the state and the city becomes more important than the individual people. Okay, next one, number, uh, uh, we've got a scripture again, and uh, I'll need to read it because I can't see it. Two Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26 says this. 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay, we'll have the next one. So this is Cafe Terrace at Night by Van Gogh. I hope we can see it clearly enough. I've got as high a resolution picture of it as I can. Now for many, this painting by Van Gogh is one of his most important paintings. If you look at the paintings, like most people will just see an ordinary, unremarkable scene, albeit one that's painted with the artist's trademark vivid colors, which were referred to in the song that we sang this morning. Yet many believe this picture is a symbolic portrayal, a representation of the Last Supper. Now that may seem strange at first thing, but let's look at the evidence that some of points to why some people have made that conclusion. First of all, it's worth remembering that Vincent van Gogh was a son of a Protestant minister. He was a man who clearly had a faith. It was a troubled faith and he suffered from today what we would call Melton illness, but he had a troubled yet sincere faith. And that's one of the reasons art critics believe that many of Van Gogh's works display a relationship between art and Christian imagery. And for many, Cafe Terrace at Night offers one of the best examples of this theory. You see, the Last Supper was the meal at which we heard that Jesus finally sat down to eat with his 12 disciples. And if you can see them, I'm not sure you can see them clearly in the painting the picture behind me, this Van Gogh painting portrays 12 people sitting down to eat, and there's a long-haired central figure standing amongst them. Experts say that this is a very unusual painting because although it's set at night, there is no black paint used at all in the painting of this picture. No black, just deep, beautiful deep blues and violets and greens to create the dark, the idea of a nightscape. A coincidence? People say not. Some also suggest the composition of the 12 diners is set within a sort of yellow hue, a halo surrounding them. And experts have also pointed out that there are a number of hidden crosses in the painting, including one directly behind the Christ-like figure, and interestingly, that cross is what is called the vanish, it serves as the vanishing point of this painting, which is an artistic term for where your gaze goes and centralizes on and is the central core of the picture. Okay, next one. Now, this is Edwin Luc G. Lucas, The Human Situation, which is actually, you can view it in the Edinburgh City Art Gallery. Now, Edwin Lucas was born in Leith near Edinburgh on the 30th of March, 1911. He showed talent in drawing and painting at an early age, and he won the art drawing final in the school competition. But his parents dissuaded him from becoming an artist and pursuing a career in art. This was due to the fact that his uncle, G. E. G. Handel, who was a very well-regarded Victorian art artist, struggled to make a living and lived the latter, latter part of his life in poverty. But during the 1930, Lucas, he worked, but he painted exclusively in watercolors, and he had work accepted into the Royal S Society of Scottish Painters as early as 1933. But his style began to change, and he became more adventurous when he was impacted by the Surrealist movement, and he started painting in this emerging style that was, that was appearing all over Europe. From, from the, in the 1930s and 40s, he painted numerous surrealist paintings and drawings during the period. Some of them make overt common references that the sur surrealists were motivated by. Things, subjects like dreams and psychoanalysis, and he is seen to borrow ideas and images from people like René Magritte and Salvador Dali. But it's important to know that Edwin uh, Lucas was a committed Christian all his life, and he was a pacifist throughout his life. In fact, he was a conscientious objector in the Second World War, and he was assigned to work in a military hospital during the war, portering and, and, and moving patients around. But he continued to paint alongside doing that job, and his job 
in med and, and medical health after the war. During this time, and particularly after the, the trauma of the Second World War, he continued to produce really unorthodox and experimental work, much of which is like anything else any contemporaries in the UK were doing. During the 1950s, he produced prolific amounts of art, but he was largely ignored. His story is very similar to that of Lowry from Manchester before him. The artistic establishment ignored people who had real jobs in the family life and they weren't full-time artists. But Lucas believed you could really only go where you felt you were being led and directed to paint by being free to have separate employment and then you weren't having to respond to commissions or requirements that were put on you. Which is interesting, isn't it? He died of leukemia only in 1990 and his work really remained pretty unknown during his life. But in 2013, the Scottish Gallery, uh, the National Gallery and the Museum of Art came across five of his paintings in their, what's the word, you know, with a story, Jerry, which weren't on display. And they entered them into the, their new finds and acquisitions display just that year. And at that point, many of the UK papers and the art establishment discovered this important surrealist artist for the first time. Subsequently, in the last 10 years just, some of his paintings are now hung next to masterpieces all around the world by people like Dali, Magritte, Miro, Ernst, and other stars of what is called the Surrealist Movement. Now, when we visited the exhibition in Glasgow to see these paintings, we were interested at the fact of the talks that were given because no reference was made to his Christianity. And they, they described some of the paintings as really impossible to interpret and what the symbolism mean, which was interesting for us because we could see very clear symbolism in them of Christian imagery. Because today, of course, art, many art experts and historians don't have any biblical literacy when approaching works that were inspired by people who had a Christian faith. So I don't pretend to be an expert, but it's very clear to me that there are biblical images in this. Anyway, moving swiftly along, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. We're painting number 6, and this is Guernica by Pablo Picasso will be coming up. And Revelation 6, 2 says this, I looked, I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So if we can have the next picture up, please. Another challenging one for you. This huge gray, black and white painting was done by Picasso at his home in Paris in 1937. It is regarded by many art critics as one of the most moving and powerful anti-war pictures ever painted. It's 11 and a half, nearly 12 feet tall and 25 and a half feet wide. And the painting shows the suffering of people and animals wretched by the violence and chaos of war. If you want to get an idea of the size of it, if any of you have been to the Odeon, one of the big screens in the Odeon, it's around about that size. It's like a big screen in the cinema. Guernica has become a universally powerful symbol warning humanity about the potential and the suffering and the devastation of war. And war is being portrayed challengingly as truly hell in this painting. Now the painting is, response, is a response to the bombing of a town called Vernica, uh, Guernica, a Basque town in northern Spain, uh, which was bombed by Nazi Germany along with Italian warplanes uh, at the request of the Spanish Nazis. Because the majority of the town's men were away fighting in a, a war on behalf of the Republicans, the town at the time of the bombing was almost entirely populated by women and children. Me, what this means is, let's be clear, what this means is Mussolini collaborated with the Nazis before the war in a war crime against his own people. The facts are reflected in the picture, picture is why it's just such a strong image of innocent, defenseless humanity being victimized and suffering. The, the scene occurs within a room where on the left side, a wide-eyed bull stands over a grieving woman holding a dead child. In the center, a white horse falls in agony with a large gaping hole in its side. The horse, interestingly, appears to be wearing chain mail armor, 
depicting on it tally marks arranged in rows depicting the, the rider's death count. A dead soldier lies under the horse and the hand of a severed arm grasps a shattered sword from out of which a flower grows. Challenging and difficult images to interpret it. But the marks in the left hand, some suggest, reflect the marks of pacing made, making this perhaps a Christ-like figure. Two hidden images have been identified within the form of the horse that appears in Guernica. A human skull overlays the horse's body. I'm not sure if you can see it very clearly in the, the picture uh, because of the lack of resolution. And the bull, uh, and, and a bull appears to gore the horse from underneath. Now it's important to remember that Mussolini often represented himself uh, with the image and the title of a bull, which is seen by some as an, an interpretation on the attack on Christianity. A full-size tapestry of the copy of Guernica, in other words, a complete life-size copy of it, is hung in the headquarters of the United Nations in New York at the entrance to the Security Council. And it's an attempt to keep world leaders mindful of the repercussions of war in their decision-making. The question that raises is how are they working out on that kind so far this century? Perhaps not too good. Okay, let's crack on to the next one, which is William Holman Hunt. And the, uh, yeah, which is uh, The Shadow of Death by William Holman Hunt. This is the first of two paintings by Holman Hunt we're going to have in my top 10 rundown. William Holman Hunt was a Victorian painter and watercolorist. Colorist. He entered the Royal Academy in 1844, where he met someone called John Everett Milius, and they became founders of what you may have heard of as the Pre Raphaelite Brotherhood. These were a group of artists who sought to return art and to, uh, to, to go back to a page prior to what they saw, the way art was produced prior to people like Michelangelo and Raphael in the Renaissance. Because they felt art had become a place where you put people of power in very overly, overtly elegant poses and mannerisms which kind of moved art away from reality. So from 1870 onward, Hunt himself concentrated on religious themes and he, inform, he informed that by his, his repeated visits to the Holy Land. Hunt's portrayal of Jesus here is that of a hard working adult craftsman and a laborer almost. And this, this, you've got to remember this is painted at the time with the emergence of a new type of socially active, some of the term is used muscular Christianity, which promoted healthy living on one hand, avoidance of alcohol, but also vigorous work ethics among reforming the, the, the society and the situation that people find themselves in terms of work and exploitation. And so it informed both personal and political life. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Hunt's earlier uh, picture of Jesus as Jesus, the light of the world. But later on, some of Hunt's colleagues and he came to felt that that picture identified more of a religious establishment picture of Jesus because it shows him in regal clothing. And you can see here later on, he's depicting a very different type of Jesus. He was really not at ease with his early work, even though the Victorian establishment around him really enjoyed it. From his rebellious student days on, he questioned everything as he struggled with his faith and his, his painting technique. But although agnostic in his youth, he, he, con he converted to a deeply felt Christian faith, but not only changed his life, but it changed his art. And over his time, his paintings became more and more distinctive and evocative and symbolic of Christian ideas. He saw himself as a messenger offering reconstructions of biblical scenes as prophetic and provocative images to help his fellow Christians. Behind the surface of the paintings are layer of meanings which allows people who were biblically literate at that time to read the paintings like a book. A couple of things worth pointing out in this painting is the portrayal at the bottom left, you'll see Mary's careful financial stewardship is emphasized by noting that she has kept the gifts brought by the Magi 
in the Nativity story. We'll see in a moment an even more deeply symbolic picture of his work. But if you're interested in Holman Hunt and the other pre-Raphaelite artists, one of the best places you can visit is on our doorstep, which is John Ruskin's home in Brantwood, on, called Brantwood on the shore of Lake Coniston. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. I'll not read, I'll move straight to the picture because I can see time's going on. And we're, uh, we're at number four in our countdown, so there's four more to go. And this is Millet's Gleanings. And the scripture was the story of Ruth gleaning in the field. Now this chap, Millet, was one of the leading artists of what's called the French Realism Movement. Uh, this picture was painted in 1857, and it focuses on portraying people and situations of the present time of the present day with great detailed accuracy. And Millet is particularly famous for his painting of peasants, and one of his paintings called Angela Shows Peasants uh, Having a Break from Work and Praying, which is one of the ones I do an individual talk on. But his most famous, that's his most famous one. But for me, this is also a powerful painting, and it's one of a famous trio of painting which include Ang Ang Angelus, Presence of Prayer, The Sower, and this one, Gleanings. The subject of the painting, Mele, in this one is the gleaning, which is, appears in the Book of Ruth, which is the act of scarring a field after the harvest in search of leftover crop missed during the first harvesting. Very familiar pattern from the Book of Ruth. Now, there is the tiniest suggestion, if you look along the horizon line of a church, on the right, and it is the ringing of the church bells which would have led the peasants to both begin and stop their work, and at points in the day when they would pause for prayer. Now the three women in the foreground are seen bending over and raking the scarce remains of the, of the crop. Gleanings, gleaning in the fields was the occupation of the poorest and most desperate members of the rural society that existed in Europe in that day and in Ruth's day in the Bible. But the meaning of this painting goes deeper than a simple depiction of the hardships of the poor. Mealy goes further and demonstrates the hierarchy between the rural and the working cl class through some contrasts which are shown in the picture. Take note of the little tiny small sheaves of women, the sheaves that the women have in their hands, which is a metaphor for the poverty, and social insignificant contrasted the huge grain stacks in the background, which is the, the harvest set aside for the landowners. Some say Mila's use of light also suggests this distance between the classes and emphasizes the social exclusion of the people who were gleaning. They point out the sun shines down on the group of paid workers in the, in the light clothes and in the house in the background, while the marginalized gleaners are placed in the shadows at the front. Now, interesting, I listened to uh, uh, some writing on this by Ruskin, and he talked about the fact that, in this painting is really good advice for you of how to, to work if you've got a bad back. And I, had a very, I have a very bad back, and I actually applied this, and it really does work. The idea of, pick, if, you, if you need to go around and pick things up with a bad back, put one hand behind, down like that, and I find, yeah, well, you know, art can teach you something really practical and helpful. So for those of you who've got a bad back, one hand behind the back and one hand forward is, Paula's probably gonna tell me off because she's a physio that that's not good advice, but it, but it worked for me. And I very rarely pick things up now when I, when I fall. In fact, I haven't picked anything up since about 1990. I just say, Paula, <laughs> come and pick that up. Okay, let's move on. Uh, and we've got the hireling shepherd. And the scripture is from John 10, which says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling who is not the shepherd and the one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As, my, as the Father knows me, even so I know this. The Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep that I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring that they will hear my voice 
and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, next one. So this is a brightly colored detail painting of a shepherd and a shepherdess called the Harling Shepherd, 1851. And again, Holman Hunt again, the pre laphorite <laughs> This shepherd is a Harling. That's a reference to a false, unregenerate religious leader, just like the one described in the Gospel of John chapter 10. In the center of this picture, you see the young shepherd Des leaning back on her right arm, perhaps maybe flirting slightly with the shepherd, who is leaning forward on his knees with one arm around her shoulder, and he's showing her a death head's moth in his hand. Notice the natural, rough, rural look of these people. It's back to that natural, not at all sort of fancy image of people. Notice also how the hireling shepherd's sheep have strayed because they're uncared for. He's got his attention on other things, shall we say. And they strayed beyond the trees into a cornfield of the right, of, on the right. And some of the sheep are already amongst the corn. Eating raw corn is very dangerous to sheep. And in the left foreground, you see two bloated sheep lying on the ground, poisoned because they've probably eaten the raw corn. The shepherdess has a lamb on her lap, partly covered with a red shawl, and she's eating harmful, sour crab apples, two of which have fallen to the ground beside her. Her bare feet are close to a small stream in the right corner, and there are yellow and purple flowers in the foreground with poppies on the border of the cornfield, which some art historians ascribe all sorts of meaning to. A line of tall trees is visible in the background to the left, with a field containing rows of safe and edible hay behind. So there was good forage for the sheep, but the hireling shepherd hasn't ensured that the sheep got it. Okay, we're up to number two in our top 10 rundown, which is, I'll read the scripture from Mark 15. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the King of the Jews. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Some of you may have seen it. It's the 1951 painting called Christ of St. John of the Cross by Salvador Dali. The painting is known as Christ of St. John of the Cross, and it composing, in its composition, it exists, consists of a triangle, which is formed in the arms of Christ, horizontal on the cross, and a circle, which is formed by the head of Christ placed in the center. Experts say the triangle is a symbolic reference to the Trinity, and the circle rep represents the unity of the Godhead within the Trinity. Now, although the painting is a uh, representation of the crucifixion, please note it's deliberately not portraying Christ as a crushed or defeated saviour as he appeared in a lot of Renaissance art. This is a cry inspired by the narrative told within the fourth Gospel of John, which is why he calls it Christ of John of the Cross. Gone is the tortured body of a wasted, defeated Christ. Uh, this is the... This is, that was the, tended to be the view in most Renaissance Catholic painting at the time. Dali here has Christ muscular and directly shown from above, looking down from the clouds on the earth below. In other words, we're seeing Christ from a heavenly perspective and perhaps representing symbolically the heavenly view of God the Father of his Son on the cross. Interestingly, the Son Christ will share the same perspective as the Father, as the view follows and continues that of the Father down to earth. The fourth gospel stresses that the Son's obedience to the Father is one of seeing him do whatever the Father directed him to do. And the fourth evangelist also stressed that Jesus is the master of his own destiny. He goes to his death because he chooses to remain obedient to the will of the Father above. Interestingly, Christ of St. John of the Cross was voted Scotland's favorite painting in a 2006 poll. And now for my number one. Let's see, this will surprise a few of you and may challenge a few of you, but it's a painting from 1927 by Sir Stanley Spencer and it's called 
the Cookham, Cookham Resurrection. And it's in Tate, Britain, London, and you can go and view it today. All nine of, uh, nine of these 10 paintings I've seen in real life, apart from Guernica. And this is a staggering painting when you see it, in, uh, you know, when you stand in front of it. When it was first displayed in 1920, at the Times art critic said this about it, this is the most important picture painted by an English artist in the present century. This huge painting is set in the grounds of a real, is set in the grounds of a real church in the village where he lived, Holy Trinity Church, Cockham. Cookham, sorry. The Church of England village is in, that church is in the village where the artist lived most of his life. In his case, the local churchyard in the village where he lives has become the setting of the resurrection of the dead, as mentioned in Thessalonians and Revelation. Christ is enthroned in the church port, cradling three babies with God the Father standing behind. And Spencer himself is the near naked figure standing in the center before his savior. Now, interestingly, the painting, the people in it, show spend representations of Spencer's friends and family and the real residents of the village in which he lived, which was a village of less than 300 people. And it says these villagers that are emerging from the graves watched by the figure of God and Christ and the, and the apostles and the prophets. Locals would look at this picture and recognize themselves in the artwork. And even the local postman is depicted as one of the characters in it. To the left of the church are some of the resurrected and they're climbing over a stile and others are making their way to a river. At the very top, we see the risen souls being transported to heaven in pleasure steamers, which this village is, is on the Thames, about, it's about 70 miles from London, but it's about 800 miles up the Thames as the Thames meanders. And pleasure steamers used to, to go up and down the river on that scenic part of it. So the resurrected souls are being transported to, he to heaven in the pleasure steamers, which were a familiar scene at the stopping point in the village. But others are seen to just be around inspecting their own headstones and looking at what they say. Spencer's work, and not just this painting, all his work, express his fervent, as it was described, if unconventional Christian faith. And this is very evident in the series of paintings that he did on the resurrection, all of which, this is one of which, of a series, were a bit situated in the village in which he lived. I believe on one level this shows a compassion for the people he lived with and for the souls of his fellow residents. He wanted to tell them, warn them and tell them about heaven and hell. And I believe in a sense for him, who never really traveled outside the village much, that he felt his home village was a sort of picture of paradise in which everyone and everything in the community, even a small community like that in which he lived, could be invested with spiritual significance. I also think he believed that this principle could be applied to everyone everywhere if they would just bring God into their everyday life. All of his resurrection paintings, Spencer uses greys and lavaters and pale greens, and it suggests a sort of translucent, silvery, moonlit world. It's almost as if people in all his paintings are emerging from a sort of dream, and they're unaware of, of the world that they're actually returning to and what it means, or a world they're leaving behind. By choosing not to pick the dead rising to a bright shining sun for me suggests that within the painting we have to remember that there are different destinations implied for some of the people there. Now for a long time this painting at Tate in London, I believe deliberately by the choice of the people who displayed it, they tried to recreate what they called a spatial encounter with it and it hung for many years over the stairs that led down to the basement restaurant. It's about 30 feet wide, again, like a cinema screen size paintings, and you had to go down two wide flights of Victorian stairs and go under it to go down into the restaurant. And it was almost like it implied 
<laughs> you're descending to an underworld. That was one possibility that this picture could mean for people who, view, who viewed it. Now, for some, they said, oh, that marginalized the work. It should be one of the main galleries. And they moved it into a main gallery. And I saw it 20 years later. I saw it when I was 12 over the stairs. And then I saw it again 20 years later. And it's in a main gallery now. And it didn't have that impact. It doesn't give the, 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 the sense that you have a choice to make and there are two potential destinations. And the an original position, I believe it really created an amazing juxtaposition between the world in which we live and the potential future destinies. And that has kind of keeping with me with Spencer's desire to mix the sacred and ordinary with ordinary people. For me, Spencer is not a religious painter in the classic sense of the word and all the famous artists with biblical scenes you see, but I kind of say, thank the Lord for that. He's a, I believe he's a great modern painter who was inspired by his faith and his understanding of Christian doctrine to explain it through modern art. He is a translator of thoughts and dreams through his paintings and his upbringing, which really, for me, show an intensely personal faith. He's a classic Christian visionary, but a prophet almost, but in a very modern context, living within a community and its sense of its own vision. So that's my top 10. So what Paul is gonna do, and you can do it when you have lunch, is he's gonna send out a little form where their 10 paintings are listed, and I'd like you to vote for your favorite one. Just put a tick beside it. And you know, maybe you've had your views changed and maybe it won't be the painting that you would have thought you would have voted for at the start. But other than that, that's it for this time. Jill, Jill.